Okay, so I'll make a start. Welcome everyone to KRB204 Web Interface Design. My name is Dave and I'll be your tutor for this semester. Uh, so first I just want to start briefly um, maybe clearing up a few expectations about what we do in this unit. So it is called Web Interface Design and a lot of people interpret interface design as a purely visual uh, undertaking. Um, and that is a big part of it, but uh, I also want you to think about that uh, in more general terms. So actually, Wikipedia has a fairly good uh, definition of an interface. Okay, so it says, in the field of computer science, an interface is a tool and a concept that refers to a point of interaction between components and is applicable at both the level of hardware and software. So we really want to cover all of that uh, and, and the keywords in there, and this is something that Deb mentioned in slightly different terms in the first lecture, uh, is uh, we want to think of an interface as anything where there's uh, a point of interaction between components. Um, and those components can be a person and a computer, or a computer and another computer, a piece of software and hardware, software and other software. So yes, while we will be focusing on the visual design of web interfaces, we also want to strongly think about uh, interaction design, the way which people interact with an interface. <clears throat> and then later on we're going to look at um, uh, interfaces where, where uh, web, where web technologies interface with other web technologies. So in particular what we're going to look at uh, things like APIs uh, for um, accessing and combining real-time data from uh, various sources across the web. Uh, but that'll come a little bit later on. So, but I just want you to keep that in mind that um, this is by no means going to be a purely visual undertaking in this unit. Um, now, m most people tend to put themselves in, in one or the other category. They consider themselves uh, a visual designer or they consider themselves more of a technical a coder or a developer kind of person, So, um, which, is, which is completely fine. That's understandable, um, whether it's a left brain, right brain thing or whatever, or whether it's an interest thing. Um, who would consider themselves more of a, a visual person? Yep, and who would consider themselves more of a, a technical development kind of person? Yep, a couple of those. So that's that's totally fine. And the way that we've tried to structure the assignments in this uh, in, in this unit are such that you can focus on what you want to focus on more. So if you want to really hit the, the visual side of it harder, then by all means uh, you can do that. If you want to really explore the technical implementation of things, uh, then, then hopefully they allow you to do that as well. Um, but but while, while you may feel like you have a natural predilection to one side or the other, uh, what we really want to emphasize is that some crossover knowledge between the two uh, the two sides of that coin is, is actually going to be really beneficial for you. Uh, I know I, I sort of put myself in the camp where I feel like um, development, the technical side, comes a bit more easily to me or a bit more naturally to me. When I do my, my art or my design work, I really prefer to do that outside of, outside of the pressure of, of a project or work. Um, but I can certainly... I can certainly um, I guess my design process uh, is is a bit more trial and errorish than some. Uh, so there are some people who can just sort of splat out a design and it's and it's awesome uh, straight away, uh, and they just imagine it like that. Uh, for me, it, it tends to be a bit more trial and error. But to be able to do that, I still have to be able to recognise objectively what makes a good functional design. To be able to go, no, that doesn't look right. There, I've done that. That looks better. So, and the ability to do that, I think, um, I think makes makes you a, a better a better part of a team. Normally, the projects that I've worked in, um, 
I work with a team of sort of designers and developers of various different um, predilections to each, and um, usually, usually one of the more creative designery type people will come up with the original concept. Um, but then once I've got that, um, I, I find that I can quite easily um, then critique it and make suggestions for improving that. And I think the ability to do that makes me a much better developer. In, in the same way, I think uh, if, if a designer has some understanding of what's technically possible to implement, then that's going to make them a much better designer. Um, because you'll find that, you, you'll find that um, you generally, once a project gets past a certain size, uh, you'll no longer be working in one particular role. But having that crossover knowledge uh, will definitely definitely aid you in wh whichever whichever part of that uh, that you end up working in. Um, so, so my recommendation would be if you find yourself being more naturally a, a technical person, then really invest a lot of time and effort this semester into um, reading up on a lot of design theory, um, so so that you strengthen that side of it, and in the same way. If you find that, that designing visually is a breeze, then I'd suggest investing heavily in trying to learn some of the technical ins and outs of, of the tools that we use to implement these. So you can't ever really escape having a little bit of crossover because, um, because, because if we can agree that interfaces are not purely visible, uh, visual, that they're, they're interactive, then in order to demonstrate that, you're going to need some sort of functional implementation of a, of a design or a prototype in order to communicate that uh, to a client or to uh, other designers. Uh, and in the same way, uh, if, you're, if you're a developer, you're going, to need, uh, you're going to need to at least have the design language to be able to communicate the, the, the strengths that you perceive that your implementation has uh, in a design sense. Okay, so hopefully that um, gives you a, a, a bit more of a understanding of, of where we're trying to come, where, where we're trying to get to uh, in this unit. Um, you'll notice that you'll notice that the tutorials that I go through are a bit more technically oriented. I don't want that to give you the impression that that's more important. Uh, it's just that uh, the tutorial formats suit teaching that material a bit more easily. So um, you'll find the lectures and especially any reading materials um, that we give you uh, will be the kind of design stuff that you should read up on. So try not to, try not to neglect that because it's going to be a huge part of uh, your, your project to actually be able to effectively communicate and defend your design. So um, it's kind of a saying that the uh, doesn't matter how good a design is, it's only really as good as your ability to communicate uh, its, its effectiveness to whoever is interested in the design, um, usually the client. Uh, okay, um, and the other thing I just want to mention before we get on to uh, the content for today is I generally screen record all of the tutorials uh, just because I've found that completely understandably over the course of two hours you're almost guaranteed to tune out for five seconds every now and then uh, and it's it, it's a lot easier for me to just say go and watch this part of the tutorial again than it is to type out an email and answer any questions so uh, I, I do tend to record them and try and have them up by the end of the week and I'll post links to them uh, as well uh, that shouldn't be a substitute for coming to class because what you don't get is the ability to ask questions straight away and also another big thing which I really want you to do is collaborate with the other people in the class. Um, don't underestimate don't underestimate sort of discussion and debate with other designers in, in refining your concepts uh, and that's something that you really need to uh, have face-to-face -face contact with your classmates to do. Um, Let's see, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover for the intro. Uh, I, I have a blog which uh, we generally post the content for the tutorials just because I find it a lot easier to maintain and update than using the black 
blackboard and you can find that at this address dave.if90.net Okay, and I'll update this every week with, um, with new content. So generally what we'll have is a little bit of an introduction um, and then maybe a, an exercise or two and the next week I'll, uh, after that I'll usually post the solution to any exercises so you can compare what you've done with, well, with what I've done. Um, so as you can see there's a few different um, units up here. Uh, in the menu, there's KRB 204 and tutorials, and if you go to week two, that will have the content for today's tutorial. Okay, so before I go on, are there any questions or concerns that anyone has about the unit? Anything anyone wants to ask? No? Okay, cool. Alright, so I'm going to start off uh, by covering a few useful learning resources. Um, a, lot of, a lot of other non, uh, I guess, non-creative industries units have textbooks. They don't really have textbooks, but we have, we have books and articles that we reference. Um, but by the, the nature of web design being on the web, you'll find that most of the really useful resources are actually on the web itself. Uh, now, uh, through QUT, you have you actually have access to a couple of really good uh, resources that you would otherwise have to pay quite a lot of money to have access to, uh, and you access the, these to the library database portals. So, which I have a link to here. Okay, now the first one uh, that I will mention is Lynda.com. You may have heard of it before. They uh, do uh, training video tutorials for various different software, essentially. And if we click on that. Uh, you need to log in uh, to access it using your QT login. And to log into your account, uh, you actually just use your QT uh, email. and password. <coughs> okay, and then you have access to their entire library of uh, training videos. So they usually get people who are pretty well respected in their field uh, and the production quality of their videos is, is pretty good. So this is a really good, really good resource, uh, particularly if you prefer to learn visually or learn by watching someone do something and then repeating the task. Uh, so you can sort by subject, software, um, all this stuff. Uh, so, for example, if we want design, we can have a look down here, or you can do a search. So, for example, if I want to search for, let's say, responsive design, let's search up here. Okay, and I get all of their courses um, based on uh, responsive design principles. Okay, and actually I won't play that because then I won't be able to upload it to YouTube, but uh, basically uh, I, I'd strongly suggest having a look at this um, uh, and taking a look at uh, some of the courses. There's a lot in here that would be relevant um, to this particular subject. Anything on anything on web design and development. So you get you can get more designing ones, you can get technical instruction on, on um, web, web languages and all this sort of thing. Uh, but I'll leave that up to you to explore that. That's a really good one. The other one that you have access to through the QUT library is Safari Books Online. Okay, so this is a repository of a bunch of different um, training uh, books uh, for in, in, the, in the overarching uh, sort of IT category. Uh, so probably the ones that are going to be most useful to you would be uh, ones on web development, for example. 
okay but there's also um, there's also ones more generally on design uh, I did find the I did find the book that Deb mentioned in the first lecture in here um, I can't remember what it's called but if you search for it you will find it and you can uh, you can read them online and I think you can even download uh, a PDF or a or some sort of digital copy of the book as well um, it's supposed to expire you check it out but there's nothing to stop you checking it out multiple times so this is another really fantastic resource that you would normally have to pay a lot of money for um, uh, but you now have access for free um, through the QT library okay now aside from that uh, I have put a bunch of links here to some of the websites there's thousands and thousands of websites as I'm sure you know uh, on the topic of web design and development uh, I've just listed here some of the ones that uh, I've found uh, and I think are pretty pretty good pretty useful um, I'm sure you have your own already that you frequent and you'll find new ones uh, in addition to these but uh, some of the some of the popular ones are webplatform.org which is pretty new uh, but it's it was it's was set up by the uh, W3C uh, to basically uh, aggregate learning resources uh, based on the web standards that they develop. Uh, so it's it's actually very similar to the next one that I've got, which you probably have heard of because it's been around uh, a while longer. W3Schools.org. So this is this is a privately run website, um, and it, it's got excellent information and, and examples and um, sort of try it yourself areas uh, on all lots of different technologies, and that's all fine if you like that one. That's great. Uh, I believe webplatform.org was set up in response to W three schools to have a, a fully open uh, sort of non. Uh, non-profit organization for having this same sort of information. Uh, then you've also got the Mozilla Developer Network which is a uh, similar thing um, but run by uh, Mozilla. Uh, it's actually laid out pretty well and then you've got here the Google Developers University Consortium. Uh, so Google has released a whole bunch of tutorials and classes and courses for all this different sort of stuff you find that this is probably more advanced stuff rather than sort of the fundamentals or the basics they have uh, you know things like um, getting started with the Google Earth API how to use fusion tables obviously a lot of this is going to be Google centric as well uh, but uh, but useful nonetheless particularly as you get into more complex examples I guess so again, I'll, I'll mainly leave that up to you to search through those. You decide what's useful for you and what isn't. Um, everyone works differently. There's nothing wrong with that. So these are really generally quite technical um, documentation uh, and references. And then I've split off here some other links, which uh, while they still focus a bit on development, but you'll find things that are more design-oriented as well. So in these links, you'll find a lot more design theory uh, that will be useful as well. So there's Smashing Magazine, which for a few years has been kind of the holy grail of, of design, web design blogs. Um, so they have a bunch of uh, excellent articles in a bunch of different categories from various different uh, people who are usually very talented, well respected in their field. Um, and, and they, they usually, uh, it, it's good for finding things about um, very up-to-date technology or emerging trends. So there's a hint for your um, first poster. If you're, looking at, if you're looking for things to put on that, then, then these bunch of links are probably going to be quite useful for you. Uh, they also have a really excellent collection of books. Um, and they've, they've branched out into a whole bunch of different books lately, but... I would say they probably their famous one is the Smashing Book, which kind of aggregates a lot of information from the website. 
But if you were only to ever read one book on web design, I'd say read this one, Smashing Book. It's really, it's a really excellent, reasonably high level overview of everything from design to implementation for a website and includes things like basic design theory and 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 how that translates into an implementation um, so you do have to buy it it's um and I'm not spruiking for them or anything but it is it, as far as textbooks go that's pretty dirt cheap actually especially if you buy it as an ebook um, but yeah as I said if you only ever read one book on web design, I'd make it that one, the smashing book. Uh, you've got a list apart, uh, which is uh, another, is, this, this is quite sort of high level design oriented, um, quite often a lot of, uh, a lot of um, very new topics get posted here, so you'll find things like the first the first description of, of Web 2.0, the first description of responsive design, that kind of thing um, quite often uh, comes up very early on in, in this particular website. Uh, web Designer Wall is, is a smaller website, it's just one guy, but uh, he, posts some, he posts some nice, usually tutorials, but it's, it's a nice blend of, of design and implementation. Uh, and then you've got HTML5 Rocks, which is, as the name might give away, pretty heavily based on HTML5 and its, its features, um, and it contains articles as well as uh, tutorials. And this one, which I just found quite recently, 24 Ways, it's kind of interesting that they only post articles uh, in the month leading up to Christmas. They call it the Designer's Advent Calendar. but. Um, some quite interesting articles, particularly ones in here I found from people who consider themselves developers who um, who attempt in their own way to describe um, a design for developers. So that might be kind of interesting if uh, if you consider yourself more of a more of a tech, techie person than a designer. Okay, so they're just a few. There's heaps out there. I'm sure you've got your own. Um, if anyone has any really good resources that they'd like to share, um, send me an email by all means, and um, I'll add them to that. Um, I should just check, actually, on the point of email that my contact is actually up on the blackboard. Sorry, I don't want QT virtual. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So there's my there's my contact. I did not write my own title. That was Deb's doing. <laughs> and she's misspelt my name. Awesome. Great. So my email my email address is actually dm.wallace at qt.edu.au. I will fix that. Um, I will fix that tonight. Um, but if you want to send me an email, that's almost my address. Okay. All right. So now we'll move on to. Let's have a little bit of a talk about. Uh, web design slash development tools. You'll notice I never really ever talk about web design or web development independently. I always say design slash development. And if I ever say one or the other, I'm kind of talking about one overall process. Um, okay, but so we'll talk about we'll talk about the tools and and what that sort of implies as then workflows as well. So while your tool set is not going to make you an awesome designer or developer, um, what they're going to do is allow you to develop an efficient workflow. And everyone has their own workflow. It's very rare that you find any two people who work identically. And that's just because people are different, they prefer to work different. So ultimately, you're going to find what works best for you, probably after a lot of trial and error. I, I know I've gone through probably literally hundreds of different tools, pieces of software, ways of working before I've sort of settled on what I think kind of works best for me. And I'm also constantly, constantly updating that as well. 
Uh, and it also to some extent uh, will depend on the nature of your project um, and the size of the project. Uh, if you're working by yourself then you probably don't need to care too much about tools and workflows for organization and collaboration and management stuff but if you are on a big team then that's probably going to play uh, a big role. But I've got a few suggestions here. Um, by all means take them or leave them um, or, or use completely different ones but these are just some of the common types of tools that, that people, uh, that designers and developers uh, tend to use uh, to streamline their workflow. So first off as a note taking tool, um, generally you, 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 may, you may think that you don't really need to take notes, keep it all in your head, but you will find that you, you do tend to write things down on scraps of paper or you, you'll forget stuff so, so over the course of a project so really I think a note taking, some form of note taking uh, workflow is quite important. Now whether that's a, a paper diary or, just, or a pad that you write things down on pen and paper, if that works for you that's fine. Um, I've, started using, um, I've started using Evernote uh, which I find really useful. I use it for all my meetings. I just dump stuff down, put it in there, so I know I can go back to it if I need to. A lot of the time, I never go back to the notes, but it's there if I need it, and I don't have to. Once it's there, I don't have to worry about having to remember it. Especially if you're working on multiple projects at once, um, I find it really good too because even if you do a lot of sketching on paper or, or meetings where stuff is written down on paper, you just take a photo of it and then add that to a note and you've got that all digitized there as well. Uh, it's taggable, categorizable, searchable um, and you can sync it between uh, mobile and desktop. Um, so yeah, I, I find it a really useful tool. Uh, Evernote is, has a free version. Um, I've, I only use the free version. I've never felt the need to upgrade to the pro version which just allows you to sync more data every month. Uh, and then there's also uh, Microsoft has a, a similar thing called uh, OneNote, which I haven't looked at for quite a while. I assume it still exists. Um, but anyway, that style of, of, of note-taking tool I, I find personally to be uh, really useful. But I would suggest that you need some method of keeping together all of the, the scraps of ideas and, and processes that you have, because let's not forget when you submit your assignment, part of it's going to be demonstrating your process. So if you're collecting all of that stuff um, and not having to worry about formatting it beautifully or whatever, if you're just dumping it all down, then you don't have to go back and try and remember what your process is when you get to the end. Uh, okay, so the next section is designing and prototype tools. Uh, so uh, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a debate going on in the community at the moment about um, about the difference between uh, using uh, other tools to prototype or, or, and design or just doing the design and prototyping in the browser. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily say one's better than the other because again it will really depend on your workflow. I personally for quite a while now have just done my designing and prototyping in the browser uh, because I find it to be faster for me um, usually. It does have the advantage of if you're mocking things up in the browser then there's less work in translating that design to a final product because you're already using the design language of the browser which is HTML and CSS. Uh, having said that, um, if you feel uh, like you want to do static mockups first First of all, before you go into the browser, then there's a lot of um, a lot of designers who still do that, and there's a lot there's a lot of designers who do both. You might do a wireframe on paper or in Photoshop Illustrator first, and then start prototyping in the browser. So it's not a black and white thing. There's it's a process, and where you split that process between what tools you use um, is entirely up to you. So there, I have listed a, a few. Um, uh, tools here that are specifically for creating mock-ups. Uh, I haven't used any of them to a great degree, um, but uh, if you look at the websites, you can kind of get an idea of, of, of what they are. 
So this one actually uh, calls itself the the standard for interactive wireframing. Getting everyone on the same page isn't easy. XRP lets you show your ideas clearly with interactive prototypes. It's great when designing sites, e-commerce, business apps, and mobile. Here's how it's done. Simply drag and drop widgets to the wireframe. Then edit and style them to the level you need. Next, add interactivity. Okay, so we kind of get the idea. So this class of tools is kind of specifically designed for, for mocking up interfaces. It gives you it gives you sort of uh, interface, common interface components that you can drag and drop and resize. Um, allows you to add a little bit of interactivity and style things. And then I believe that one will even sort of spit out uh, HTML and CSS for you if you want. Um, which is which is fine. I, I doubt that it will ever really prevent you from having to go up and back and start coding from scratch, but uh, it, you might you may find it useful. The other two are, are, are similar. Um, this one, Balsamic, I I think focuses less on the interactivity. It's mainly just showing static mockups, and it's designed. This one is designed specifically to look hand drawn because because there is there is an issue when you take a prototype that looks too resolved to a client sometimes they f start to focus on design elements which you're not really considering but that's all they see so this is particularly focused on looking like just layout and and structure of, of stuff uh, and this third one proto share is similar again except this is actually an online web application now all th all three of these are paid and I think this one's actually quite expensive. Uh, I haven't really found any decent free ones that do that. Um, but their usefulness is really up to you. If you think if you think they save you a lot of time, that may be worthwhile. Uh, I've used some of them and decided that I I don't really think they save me a huge amount of time. Um, so I tend to use more just your traditional design um, design tools for doing really basic mock-ups first and then doing the rest of the design prototyping in the browser. So you've got your things obviously like Adobe's Photoshop, Illustrator and Fireworks uh, for doing mock-ups and then um, a lot of people even use um, presentation tools excuse me like um, Photoshop and uh, Keynote to demonstrate particularly interactivity because it's quite easy to throw in some mock-ups and then um, set click areas which will then go to another slide and demonstrate the transition between different sections of a uh, of a multi-sectioned interface. Um, so probably more than any other section here this is really up to you and what works for you. Um, as part of the final assignment while you do have to produce a semi-functional HTML CSS prototype of your idea uh, if you feel like having any other sort of supporting materials is going to help communicate your concept, then then by all means include some of these things. You might you might want to create a, a, a sort of interactive um, click through in in Keynote or Photoshop to help demonstrate the user experience of using the interface. You may even want to create a, an advertising style. Um, uh, video for it, like you see all of the all of the iPhone, iPad, all those sort of um, app, uh, ads for those applications. They they that style of, of video is usually very good at demonstrating the user experience of using the application without getting into the nitty gritty detail of the functionality or the technicalities of it. So uh, just keep that in mind. That we've, that we've tried to keep the brief for the assignments very open. One, so that you can focus on the things that you want to focus on. Two, so that you can um, come up with any idea that excites you. And three, so that you can um, explore any other tools or methods uh, that you want for communicating your concept to, uh, to the client, or in this case, to us. Okay, so moving on, you're going to need a code edit or something to write code. Um, 
by all means do this on the command line or a notepad if you want, but if you do I think you're crazy. Um, there's hundreds of different code editors and I've linked to a Wikipedia table here which lists some of the um, both free and commercial ones for various different platforms. Uh, they range in their features from usually things like simple syntax highlighting to uh, sort of full-blown IDEs which have things like version control built in and setting up servers and all this kind of stuff which for this unit is probably overkill um, but hey if you want to do that um, go nuts. Uh, and really I can't, I can't recommend anything specific to you here because again this is going to be a really personal choice. I'd suggest trying out maybe some of the free ones. Um, the ones that they have installed, the one that they have installed on these computers here I believe is Komodo Edit which is a free version of Komodo's commercial IDE which is pretty good I think. Um, you, another one that you may want to look at is one called um, Aptana. Uh, it's listed, I think it's listed in here somewhere. Yeah, there it is, Aptana. Um, that's based on a very generic IDE called uh, Eclipse, but it's focused on web development. Um, and the one that I'm actually kind of keen on at the moment is called um, PHP Storm. And it is, it is actually a really full, um, full functioned IDE um, because a lot of the work I do is um, kind of needs that. But, um, but it, it, if, you, if you can ignore a lot of the extra buttons and stuff, it's, I think, quite a good um, editor. Uh, and the great thing about this is if you work or study at an educational institution, you can get a, a free license for this as well, um, which is another one of the reasons why I use it. Um, and probably one of the, one of the com uh, I'll mention a couple of the commercial ones. Um, there's obviously Dreamweaver, um, which has been around for ages. A lot of people like to or used to like to pan Dreamweaver because it allowed you to kind of do visual editing of stuff or what you see is what you get editing and that would chuck out really crappy code. Um, I think it's gotten a lot better and, and you can use it just as a plain IDE and ignore all that visual stuff and it's actually a pretty decent um, IDE and code editor. Uh, if you're on a Mac, a lot of Designers really like one called um, Espresso, which is quite, which is pretty, pretty basic in terms of features. But it, um, it, uh, what, what it's, what it's really good at is it allows you to have the code window and a preview window side by side. And as you make changes in the code, it live updates uh, the the preview panel. So you get a very immediate. Um, you get a very immediate feedback from what you're doing and um, that's really useful especially when you're kind of when you're designing doing designing in the browser. Um, similar to the way that if you ever used um, Firebug and, and change the CSS on the fly you get that update there that's really kind of useful and in fact actually using I'll mention it a bit later but using Firebug um, to do designing in the browser is really useful. We only danger with that is it's not persistent. Uh, as soon as you refresh the page you lose all your changes. Um, okay, so I won't say any more on code editors other than um, go and try a bunch out and find one that you like. Oh, there's actually probably one more worth mentioning. don't know if it's on here because it might be a bit new. It's one called um, Sublime Text. So Sublime Text is, there was, there was a text editor slash code editor um, for Mac which a lot of people loved which is called Text Edit. You may have heard it, it, um, it was very popular especially by, um, amongst the Ruby development community um, because it had a lot of uh, snippets and shortcuts for doing things kind of quickly. They kind of stopped development of that but some Australian guy uh, created sort of a clone um, which is now sort of taken over from that is also quite popular. I've actually got it down here. I think it's free while it's still in beta but um, 
it's quite a simple text editor, but if that's something you're right, um, but if that's something you're looking for, oh, so it's it's simple looking, but it's still very powerful. It has a lot of great shortcuts, template snippets, and stuff um, that might be worth looking at as well. Okay, so I won't say any more on code editors. Um, I could talk forever about that, but I won't. Um, and another thing you might need is um, if you're storing your files on a web server, which you won't necessarily need to do for a lot of the examples that we do in class here, but um, ultimately, uh, ultimately uh, for your final assignment you will, and probably for every other web project that you ever do you will, you'll need a FTP client which allows you to uh, which acts as an interface to uh, a remote web server, allows you to upload and download files to and from the web server. Uh, so I've just listed one here which is a popular free, free FTP client called uh, FileZilla. Uh, it's the one I use, it's fast, it's stable, um, I like it. Uh, that's about all I'll say about that for now. Uh, web browsers obviously you are going to need something to test your web project in. Uh, now, in the last few years there's been a huge leap forward uh, in the uh, development of web browsers, um, mainly due to the extra competition from Firefox and then Chrome and Safari and Opera, I guess, but mainly Firefox and Chrome. Uh, so web browsers have gotten a lot more awesome than they used to be. Uh, so. Um, it used to be it used to be that your go-to browser of choice as a web designer developer was Firefox. Probably not so much so anymore. You can get away with pretty much using any of them. Um, but a lot of people still like to use Firefox for one particular reason, and that's a plugin called Firebug, which is this thing down here, which allows you to inspect and modify uh, the code. Now, pretty much all the other browsers have something very similar to this. They just call it something different, development tools or uh, something like that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, pretty much all the browsers have something similar to this, but I still think that um, Firebug's kind of the best, nicest one to work with in terms of that. Uh, if, you've, if you've never, if you only ever install one plugin, as a web designer developer, make it Firebug because it will make your life so much easier. And you'll, you'll see me using, if you've never seen it before, you'll see me using it through the examples and hopefully you'll be able to see very quickly why uh, it's really useful, especially for finding out those niggling, annoying things that, that you can never quite seem to figure out why your web page is breaking. Uh, another plugin here, Web Developer Toolbar, which is available for multiple browsers now, allows you to do other stuff like disabling styles and looking at cookies and disabling images. So for testing your website in different states, I uh, won't go too much into that one. I don't use that a huge amount. Um, and obviously, obviously any kind of web developer designer worth their salt is going to have a few different versions of browsers. Um, so I run at the moment two different versions of Chrome, Firefox and Safari, I test in those. And I boot into Windows to test on Internet Explorer and I have to as well. Um, but depending on who your audience is, you may need to target browsers that you don't necessarily have access to different versions of different browsers. There are services for doing this for you, so you don't have to install six million different browsers and different operating systems. Uh, one of these is called, uh, so these two do a similar thing. One's called Browser Shots and the other is Adobe Browser Lab. And essentially what they do is you chuck in your, the URL to your website, you hit submit, and it doesn't usually get back to you straight away because it takes a long time to uh, basically send it out to their render farm and, and render all of these things and then take a screenshot and then send it back to you. So it'll give you a notification or maybe an email when it's done and you come back and you can look at 
what your website looks like in any of these browsers and any of these versions on various different operating systems. Okay, and Adobe Browser Labs is, is similar. Um, one of the nice things about Adobe Browser Labs is it actually lays you, uh, allows you to onion skin the layers of different ones over each other so you can see if it renders even very slightly differently on different browsers. Now that's probably something I'd only recommend towards the end of your development um, period because it's not it's not quick. Uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna do this to check every little piece of content change that you you add to it. It's it's by no means immediate, but something that's worthwhile doing uh, when you've sorted out everything that you can um, locally with your own browsers. Okay, so that is tools and workflow, and now we will. Does anyone want to have a break before we move on to the exercise? Yes, hands. Anyone want a break? Okay, we'll take uh, we'll take a five minute break, and we'll come back, and then we'll start on the uh, exercise.